Hello everybody with part two of uh, our uh, talk on uh, word literature and now we'll talk about Mahfuz in the second part and Darwish in the third part. Uh, so in this part I, uh, uh, on, on Nagib Mahfuz uh, actually uh, I will try to show that how Mahfuz and in part three how Darwish both of them how they initially achieved international fame by addressing national issues in their fiction and poetry and the development also I also focus on the and show you the development of their writing and style and themes from national to uh, universal we'll start with Nagib Mahfouz. Nagib Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1988 and he said, I had always suspected that the Nobel was a Western Prize. I thought they would never select an Eastern writer. This is in his uh, interview, uh, interviewed by Charles Chabrawi in the Paris Review, uh, issue number 129. Actually, there are other writers who, uh, who also, uh, Arab, uh, Egyptian writers, who really deserved to win Nobel Prize. If they were living in our time, I think they should, they should have won it uh, right away. And it's really a mystery how, how they didn't win. Uh, Nagim Mahfouz definitely deserved to win it, de definitely deserved to be the first uh, Arab ever to win this uh, prize, but he was not the only one. There are also Tawfiq al-Hakim, there is Yusuf Idris, and Yusuf Idris always thought that he deserved it. He, he even said that somebody called him and told him, told him that he was selected to win the prize, and he was shocked later on uh, to know that it was uh, Mahfouz who was selected. Anyhow, after uh, 1988, after Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize, the uh, translation of uh, Arabic literature increased a lot and uh, around the world and uh, the world started to notice Arabic uh, literature and uh, many of them gained international success even more than what Nagim Mahfouz uh, gained. And uh, some of these books, I will not give examples, okay, even though I have prepared some examples, but I don't want to, to give examples, but um, many works gained international uh, success and international fame, and they sold more copies, even more than uh, Nagi Mahfouz novels. But in terms of literature, are they good literature? Is this the, the right lit literature that really represents modern Arabic literature? This is the question that we need to, to ask and we need to, to consider uh, seriously because many of them really lack literary merit. Uh, the literary merit of the, the Egyptian writers who didn't, of their works, who didn't win those who didn't win the Nobel Prize, like as I said, Tawfiq uh, al-Hakim, Yusuf Idris, uh, they both deserve to win the, that prize. And their works are far better, far better, especially Tawfiq al-Hakim, especially Tawfiq al-Hakim, his works far better than uh, the, the, the literary merits in, and values in his works, far better than the modern and contemporary uh, Arabic uh, works. So actually this uh, international bestseller is not a criterion at all uh, for good quality of, of literature and uh, exactly same as the Arabian Nights I, I used that example in my first part I don't want to repeat it again but the Arabian Nights actually uh, was not considered literature uh, among the Arabs until it gained f uh, fame uh, in the West and uh, so translation here, we can look at translation as misrepresentation of literature. It's a misrepresentation of literature because when it was translated into French, uh, Italian, English, it was translated into eloquent language. When in Arabic language, it's, it, it's not written in eloquent Arabic at all. It's full of slang full of slang and full of uh, foul language and everything so that's why we we don't recommend it uh, or some parts of it we don't recommend it to uh, to young uh, kids to read 
So sometimes translation is really a misrepresentation of literature. Um, Nagi Mahfouz uh, in an interview said, I found some motives in the Arabian Nights some motives and as i said in part one the success of this arabian nights in in europe uh, just uh, uh, attracted and drew the attention of arab arabic writers arab writers to read it and to learn from it not only the arab writers writers around the world actually so he says thus i wrote my arabian nights and dates his arabian nights and days he he wrote it uh, influenced by the Arabian Nights. Um, J.M. Uh, Kuti, he, he characterized Mahfouz as a fabulist straight out of the Arabian Nights. And uh, though this is his only influence and but I myself don't agree with uh, with him in saying so Edward Said also didn't uh, agree with him and also Elias El Khouri didn't agree with uh, with him uh, so Edward Said didn't agree that with uh, could see that Mahfouz was just the outcome of of Ar uh, Arabian Nights and uh, Elias El Khouri and Edward Said they both regard Mahfouz novel as and here I quote uh, uh, Elias Al Khouri saying, it's history of the novel form. The writings of Mahfouz is the history of the novel form, from historical fiction to the romance, saga, and uh, picaresque tale, followed by works in realist, modernist, naturalist, symbolist, absurdist modes, uh, end of quotes. And indeed, when we read uh, the, the complete works of Nagib Mahfouz, we find that uh, he didn't leave a style that he didn't try. He tried his hand at everything, and he uh, he really uh, he, he was a, a man of genius. He was ingenious, uh, and uh, reading him in Arabic or in English or any language, you you will discover and you will find out that straight away. So now let us talk about Nagi Mahfouz. Uh, Nagi Mahfouz was born on the 11th of December 19. 11 and he passed away on the 30th of August 2006 uh, he in his writing I will I will show you how his writing moved from national being national to being universal in terms of theme in terms of theme he focused at the beginning on the history of ancient Egypt and then after that on the history of modern uh, Egypt in terms of writing mode he started with the historical realist narrative then moved to social realist narrative and then to modernist narrative and I will give you examples uh, now the the first example I would divide his uh, phases of writing his uh, career into different different phases the first is the from 1939 when he started writing to 1944 uh, he focused on national themes and on ancient Egypt on the the history of ancient Egypt and uh, the, the mode of writing he used was historical realism so he published three novels the first is called Abath al-Aqdar Abath al-Aqdar in Arabic the, the literal translation The Mockery of Fate in 1939 and then Radubis uh, it's a name of a girl in 1943 then uh, Kifah Tiba Kifah Tiba uh, Thebes struggle in 1944 and the in the three no novels uh, the main idea was independence from the from foreign foreign uh, especially especially Kifah Tiba uh, independence from foreign uh, armies and foreign nations and here these novels also they were published when when Egypt itself was still under the British occupation. So he was like uh, uh, trying to awaken his own people to, uh, to the importance of being liberated uh, and being, uh, to become independent from the oppressing uh, British uh, occupation. So the, uh, at that time also the nationalism, the spirit of nationalism and what was called pharaonism was so high and this this is very clear in these three novels by Nagi Mahfouz that uh, so many Egyptians at that time they focused on their identity as 
pharaohs and they belong to pharaohs and even some of them they said we are not Arabs uh, of course in terms of the, the blood lineage yes Egyptian are somehow different from from Arabs even though the mother of Arabs was Egyptian Hagar was Egyptian uh, but in terms of culture uh, Egyptians are Arabs in terms of culture because after accepting Islam uh, we accepted the Arabic language or let us say the Arabic language gradually was imposed on the on the Egyptians until it replaced the ancient Egyptian the, the Coptic language but uh, whatever historically happened the, the outcome is that the, the we use the Arabic language in our writing in the way we speak in our Egyptian way but still uh, uh, Arabic colloquial uh, Arabic uh, so in terms of culture Egyptians are Arabs in terms of the, the, the blood lineage it's uh, we are not Arabs we should draw attention we should draw a line between these uh, differences so Abath al-Aqdar uh, was called uh, in English was published under the name was Khufu, Khufu's wisdom Khufu is the the great king who, who ordered the build of building the big uh, pyramid uh, Radubis was published under the title Radubis of Nubia so uh, Abath al-Aqdar or Khufu's wisdom, it's, uh, it's about resisting fate and the inevitable destiny. It's uh, about uh, a king who uh, a sorcerer told him that a new boy uh, would be born and he would be the king and that none of your children will be, will, will, will be the king after you, will inherit your uh, throne. So he ordered the killing of all newly born uh, boys so his vizier his minister uh, many he had a son uh, born and he managed to give that uh, boy to to somebody to to let him escape the kingdom and that boy was raised up in a different part of a different land and then he in the end he he really became a king so here Mahf was trying to say that resisting fate is useless and the uh, fate will happen uh, no matter how much we resist it so and there is divine wisdom in fate there is divine wisdom in accepting fate. Uh, radopis is um, also about surrendering to one's fate radopis about surrendering and accepting uh, one's fate kifah uh, tiba uh, the struggle of Th Thebes uh, was published in English under Thebes at War and uh, it's about Ohmos, Ohmos who was the at that time Egypt was occupied by the Hoxos and there were like two kingdoms the northern kingdom and the su southern kingdom the, no the southern kingdom was referred to as Upper uh, Egypt and uh, the northern kingdom was referred to as Lower Egypt so the Lower Egypt in the north was occupied by Hoxos the Higher Egypt in the south was free and uh, uh, and uh, Ahmos uh, managed to to, uh, to, uh, to have to build an army and to free Egypt liberate Egypt from the Hoxos but the, the story is about ah Ahmos before doing all of that he fell in love with a girl from the Hexos and that girl was a princess she was the daughter of the Hexos king and he was tormented of course uh, between his love to that girl and his love of his country uh, <coughs> And again, the, the story is, is also uh, sheds light on some problems of the past and uh, the present in Egypt at that time. Um, if we move to the second phase of his writing, beginning from, we said the first phase from 1939 to 1945, the second from 45 to 47, and here he moved from writing uh, on ancient Egypt to writing on modern Egypt. Egypt describing modern Egypt and uh, again his uh, writing more changed from historical realism to social realism so he published three books uh, the first called Al-Qahir al-Jadida 
القاهرة الجديدة كايرو مودن and the second خان الخليلي خان الخليلي is uh, a local market in the heart of Cairo the old Cairo and then زكاك المداك again it's مداك علي it's a name of علي uh, published in 1947 خان الخليلي in 46 and كايرو مودن in 45 and they were published under the, uh, uh, in English under these titles كايرو مودن خان الخليلي and مداك uh, علي These uh, three novels vividly describe the life of poor people in the early years of the 20th uh, century. Uh, they really describe the local culture and the, the life of, uh, I will not say the middle class people, maybe that time there was no, at that time there was no real middle class, uh, substantial middle class, but the life of the poor people uh, in the early years of the 20th century so the the individual individual's tragedy in each novel is a representation and a reflection of the society's tragedy the tragedy faced by the whole uh, society and of course uh, uh, in these three novels we'll always find the battle the ongoing battle between good and evil and uh, there is also criticism of uh, political uh, social economical uh, and cultural environment uh, and in this novel novels the three novels Mahfouz used the stream of consciousness and indirect descriptive uh, narrative uh, focusing on time and uh, place uh, he uh, in Cairo modern in al qahira al-Gadida there were three main characters in this novel the, each one of them represents one type of people or young people lived in the in, in Cairo uh, in the early years of the 20th century and the, the th four of them were uh, uh, university students so the, the first one was religious and he believed that religion uh, should be the foundation and uh, the essence of all our ethical codes the second one believed in social justice and in the struggle that uh, the struggle in, he believed in a struggle uh, to achieve social equality so we can tell that the first one was Isla Islamist the second one was socialist the third one believed in uh, in his own or in one's own benefits so he was uh, Machiavell Machiavellian um, he just uh, he's after his own benefits the first the fourth the fourth one was a passive observer passive observer whatever will happen will happen and uh, one of the main uh, character uh, in this novel called Mahmoud Abdel Daim Mahmoud Abdel Daim that uh, Machiavellian uh, I quote what he said in the novel he said in fact any regime would turn into dictatorship if applied in Egypt so from this quote we know right away that Mahfouz is not telling us a story or a tale just to entertain us but is always criticizing the political regime at the time in another uh, part of the novel he said uh, Mahmoud Abdel Daim uh, pickpocketing is a magical art a pickpocket owns what is in people's pockets and the rulers of this country know this principle very well so uh, we can see the the sharp critique of uh, the political uh, situation at the time. In 1948, we're still with the national uh, theme, but, and we're still with the, the modern Egypt, describing modern Egypt. Uh, all his novels after that were about modern Egypt, except later on, uh, I will come to this point to explain what novel he, he used ancient Egypt as a theme but in this novel that's called uh, as sarab the Mirage he used a different mode of writing a psychological realism psychological realism Ka Kamil the, the protagonist he said in the novel I realized that I will never attain happiness and that that desire to escape will never leave me but where to escape this time Kamil it was uh, raised by his mother uh, his mother was divorced when he was young and uh, she took uh, meticulous care of him 
uh, that uh, uh, he was dependent on her uh, in everything until he was uh, 25 years old. Uh, he, he, he slept in the same bed, he shared the same bed with his mother. Um, so he couldn't break away from, from his mother and he decided, in order to break away from her, he decided to marry uh, a girl he thought he loved. But uh, he was so nervous that he thought that uh, he, uh, uh, he couldn't have a an, an normal, natural uh, sexual relationship with her and uh, he he saw a doctor and the doctor told him that he was fine it's just a psychological problem and uh, he started to try to find his happiness somewhere else by knowing some uh, prostitutes and he was fine in, in terms in comes to bed he was fine with uh, with prostitutes but uh, anyhow his wife died uh, suddenly and then his mother and uh, in another part here I say but where to escape I wish I could be created and you to become someone healthy in body and soul with no fear or rudeness someone who would dive into the sea of human life without fear or uh, aversion so uh, actually it's a person who is in search of happiness uh, without finding it no matter where he searched with and it's uh, so it's a, a psychological study a psycho a very interesting without when i say psychological study i don't want to put you off or, or to say that uh, the novel is boring or anything and full of psychological terms not at all not not at all it's very interesting novel uh, and as i said psychological realism so it's interesting as a novel and whether even if you don't get anything psychological out of it or in it, you will still be able to enjoy it as a novel in its own merit. In 1949, he published another great novel, one of his masterpieces uh, called Bidaya wa Nihaya, The Beginning and the End. Also modern Egypt, set in modern Egypt and the writing mode, uh, social realism. This novel also, uh, the, the main protagonist, Hassanin, who was Machiavellian, very selfish person, he said, I quote, he who gives in to fate will encourage it to continue doing injustice. And uh, the novel is talking about a poor family moving to a small flat in the basement level why after the death of the uh, of the father or the head of the family uh, there is no no one to take care of the family and so the family had to move to a small flat in the basement and this is again it's another critique of the social system of the time that social system at the time when the the head of the family dies there is nobody to take care of the the rest of the family and after that uh, writing and publishing that novel indeed the egyptian government uh, uh, introduced new scheme to take care of the poor family who have nobody to take care of them and uh, there is a scene at the beginning of uh, the novel when they were moving into that small uh, family and uh, b because of the hardship they faced the mother uh, she had three boys and one girl uh, the mother had to sell her furniture one piece after another and one of the pieces she sold was a big mirror and while the two workers were carrying together carrying the mirror outside the living room uh, the living room uh, Mahfuz says that the mirror uh, reflected the ceiling and while she while the mirror reflected the ceiling and while the two workers were moving of course the the, the mirror uh, shook and the ceiling the, the mother saw the ceiling in the mirror and she saw the the ceiling of her new home was shaking as though there was an earthquake a magnificent scene and it it shows that now without the head of the of the family without her husband now uh, alone uh, taking responsibility or to take care of the family the whole family she feels like the death of the head of the family is like an earthquake that happened to that family and uh, one of the characters Hassanin the youngest guy the youngest brother he was so selfish that uh, uh, the elder brother 
he didn't continue studying in order to and worked in order to but worked in illegal stuff like selling uh, drugs and so on uh, in, in order to to pay for his school and his uh, the second elder brother he had to work somewhere in another uh, city and to send the money from uh, now and then from time to time and his sister also she learned how to sew clothes and to work in some uh, houses but again she uh, she, she she was turned into a, a prostitute later on again to to give him money so he was the only one who continued uh, studying in school and everybody was pay, giving him money and paying for his studies yet he was so ungrateful to all of them and he was so selfish and he only focused on marrying a rich girl and to join the the police academy and he only cared about his prestige and uh, social prestige uh, he thought he and then later on the at the end of the novel the police uh, station a police officer called him and told him that there is a girl they caught a girl a prostitute and uh, she claimed that she was his uh, sister and he went to the police station and really saw his sister there so uh, he felt so ashamed uh, and indeed it's a great shame of course but uh, while he was walking and she was walking behind him i read to you that scene i read uh, i quoted to you in english he thought he would do it right after they had left the police station do it meaning to kill her he decided to kill her because she brought shame to the family and she brought shame to him personally his his interest is in his own uh, social prestige uh, he thought he would do it right after they had left the police station she expected that too overwhelmed with indignation he could feel her presence behind him and could hear her footsteps like bullets piercing his back and uh, in order to relieve him of uh, this dilemma she herself uh, climbed she herself uh, climbed the the sorry there's my telephone she herself climbed the the fence of the the bridge on the Nile River and she jumped into the Nile River and he when people managed to get her out and she was dead and uh, someone asked him if he knew that girl and he said no I don't I don't know her he felt he felt so uh, he was he felt ashamed of of himself he, he felt that he was so little and he started to remember uh, her uh, her words and how she sacrificed herself to for his education for him to be educated and he himself uh, jumped into the Nile river and uh, killed himself in uh, 1956 and 1957 uh, these two years witnessed the masterpieces uh, the signature of Nagim Mahfouz his uh, uh, Cairo trilogy uh, again it's modern Egypt and social realism and I say these three novels uh, better than any book of history you would read about Egypt in that describes Egypt in that um, part of uh, of history, meaning the the early years of the 20th century. Reading these three novels would give the reader uh, a perfect uh, picture uh, of how Egypt looked like and how the Egyptian people and Egyptian society was in that time. Uh, so uh, it provides uh, accounts of the patriarchal society to the extent that the, the head of the family was called Ahmed Abdel Jawad and his wife always referred to him and called him as Si Sayyid. Si here meaning master or sir, sir, let's say sir. And uh, Sayyid is the uh, meaning master. So uh, Sayyid Ahmed Abdel Jawad, his name was Sayyid Ahmed Abdel Jawad, and she always called him Sir, Sir Master, Sir as Sayyid, Sis Sayyid, Sir. And until now, Nagim Mahfouz really, it's uh, because he created that character, he made it uh, a character of flesh and blood and a real character, realistic character. So uh, until now, we still refer to this patriarchal. Uh, person, any patriarchal person, as Sis Said, the person who who tries to dominate uh, women around him 
we uh, we call that person Sis Said. Uh, and also the, the novel depicts uh, the social and political development in Egypt during that part uh, of history, in its history. In 59, another novel Another great novel came out and it's called Aulad Haritna, Aulad Haritna, Children of the Ali in 1959, for which he, he, won, uh, he won the Nobel Prize. But I think it's really very unfair, very unfair to Nagib Mahfouz to say that he got that Nobel Prize for that novel because I don't see it the best of his writing at all, at all. There are at least uh, at least ten or fifteen or even twenty novels more important and much better than this, uh, much better written by this uh, novel. Uh, but anyhow, uh, here we moved from national theme to this is the first let us let us say the first uh, points where he shifts shifted from the national theme to universal uh, theme. So he uh, he described the pre-modern Egypt, not the modern Egypt, pre-modern Egypt, and uh, its allegorical representation, and it's written, the narrative is a modernist narrative. And it's an allegorical account of the history of the ancient world, from the beginning from the story, of, from Adam, from the story of creation, from Adam until our modern time. Uh, and in the end, at the end of the novel, a character called Arfa will kill his grandfather, who is Gabalawi. And now I will explain to you the meanings and the symbols of each name in order to know what he means exactly. So, because Arfa here is actually the science, and Gabalawi is God. So it's like in our time we don't need need religion. We need. Uh, science. Uh, people, some people understood it this way, even though Nagi Mahfouz said, I didn't mean that. And that's why uh, some uh, some uh, fanatic, uh, Muslim uh, fanatics really uh, called him non-Muslim kafir and one of them, one a young guy attacked him later on crazy. Of course, it's really madness. Uh, so, Gabalawi Gabalawi, the main character, the grandfather, Gabalawi. Gabalawi is from the word Gibilla, meaning, meaning the nature or, uh, yeah, it's like nature. So Gabalawi here, and also coming from the word Gabal, which is mountain. So anyhow, referring to, to strength and power. So Gabalawi is God in the, in the novel. And then Adham, his son, Adham, as we can tell, Adham, referring to Adam you can you can feel if you, even if you are not Arab you can you can hear the 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 similarity in the sound Adam Adam Idris Idris another character Idris is Satan Idris in Arab Satan in Arabic is Iblis so Idris is actually Iblis meaning Satan Umayma 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 coming from the words Umm Umm meaning mother so Umayma is Eve Adam is Adam Umayma is Um, meaning Eve, the mother, our mother. Then Galil, Galil is the Archangel Gabriel. You can, you can tell the closeness in the sound. Then Gabal, Gabal meaning mountain, referring to Sinai mountain, on which uh, Moses talk, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, talk to God. So Gabal is Moses, and Gabal also, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a symbol of strength and power. Uh, so, uh, and to be solid. Rifa'a, Rifa'a is Jesus. Why? Because the word Rifa'a from Rifa'a, from being ascended or uh, being lifted up from hi being, uh, from highness itself, the word highness, so Rifa'a. So Jesus here, it's Jesus because he was ascended, ascended to heaven uh, according to our uh, Islamic faith. Then Qasim, Qasim is Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, uh, because he was nicknamed uh, Abul Qasim, uh, the father of Qasim. So the word Qasim, the character Qasim here is referring, actually refers to Muhammad. Then Arafa, Arafa meaning uh, it's knowledge. Arafa from Ma'rifa meaning knowledge. So Arafa, the magician in the novel, is actually science, and what Mahfuz wants to say that science uh, will prevail in the in our 
society is what we need in our society uh, but he didn't say that on the expense of the religion whatever his intention was then he in 1961 until 1965 he continued with these universal themes and he returned to talk about modern Egypt uh, he used naturalism in his writing uh, existentialist uh, questions he posed some existentialist questions and uh, the narrative he used was modern modernist narrative the novel was called the thief and the dogs Allah another masterpiece uh, of Mahmoud Darwish Saeed Mahran is the the main character the protagonist he seeks revenge from all those who betrayed him and it's said that this story is in, was inspired by a true story and uh, he he talks in this novel about opportunism in the society in the in Egypt at that time and about the absurdity of life when everybody around him betrayed him almost everybody uh, and then he wrote another novel uh, actually uh, a few novels he wrote depicting the same thing universal themes set in modern Egypt and he used more for mode of writing he used uh, modernist narratives and also naturalism and he posed existential uh, existentialist questions the second novel was autumn quail as Simmanuel Kharif uh, in nine published in 1962 uh, it portrays a former Wafdist, one from the Waft. Waft is a political party that was the ruling party before 1952, uh, the main party, I mean, and uh, main political party. And but after the 1952, the military coup in 1952, uh, that was some people call it revolution, whatever you call it. Anyhow, he was neg neglected and he didn't find a job for himself and he didn't find any uh, merit or value or importance f for himself to do in life so he started to search for the meaning of uh, of life in general not only the meaning of his life his name the main character uh, protagonist is called Isa at the bar he says in the novel whatever we do will remain jobless because we have no role to play this is why we feel exiled just like an appendix uh, he felt himself to be jobless or to be uh, worthless and he wished Egyptians to travel away to emigrate to other parts of the world words uh, especially to South America uh, and he said indignant he said Egyptians are reptiles not birds Egyptians are uh, reptile. He wished Egyptians to be like birds and travel abroad, but he said Egyptians were reptiles, not birds. Uh, because he dreamed of having uh, a national uh, or uh, he dreamed of ha having a radical uh, change uh, in the society. Uh, but nothing of that happened, uh, of course. Uh, in 1965, he published another novel, great novel called The Beggar, a Shahad, and uh, it's about a successful lawyer who who is married to a beautiful uh, woman who loves him so much, but uh, he was so unhappy, and uh, he tried to find happiness somewhere else. He searched for the meaning of life uh, first through visiting nightclubs and knowing uh, prostitutes and but uh, nothing nothing gave him happiness brought him happiness and in the end he turned to mysticism and he almost lost his uh, mind so it's a it's a wonderful novel and again it uh, poses existentialist questions about the meaning of life um, and uh, happiness uh, another one this is here the uh, the three novels were published in one book the bigger in english i mean uh, the bigger and the thief and the dogs and the awesome quails and in these three novels we can f we can see there is a sense of estrangement overwhelming the the protagonist in the three novels all of them they search for something 
whether it's happiness or meaning of their life or uh, value for themselves or home or what they were searching of uh, of something uh, let's say search for, for a home a home in their own ways and in their own different interpretations so uh, all of them existentialist questions raised by the protagonist in the novels in 64 another magnificent novel it's called at tariq the search literally the at tariq meaning the way the path it's like the the taoist way the way in english it's, it was published under the the search because the the protagonist was in search of his father the protagonist called sabir sayyid sayyid ar rahimi sabir literally means patient so he was patient in his search because throughout the whole novel he was searching for his father who uh, uh, whom he never met uh, only his mother told him you about his father your father named so and so um, Sayyid meaning master, so his name patient then Sayyid Sayyid Ar-Rahimi, Ar-Rahimi uh, meaning uh, from mercy, it's meaning the merciful. <clears throat> but So actually his father here existed but, and he was in search of his father, but actually he didn't exist anywhere, he couldn't find him anywhere. So actually the father, the search for his father, he is a symbol. The father, he's searching for what? Searching for the, for uh, identity, searching for destiny, searching for truth, searching for God, searching for what? It depends on the reader and how you want to interpret it. But he was searching for something that, that existed yet it did not exist, or he could not find it at the end of the novel. He could not find it. Um, and actually, uh, it's also. That no novel, it's uh, it reflects Nagi Mahfuz uh, uh, himself and his character and his personality. He's uh, he, he actually is a graduate of uh, philosophy department in Egypt in the University of Adab, University of Arts. So these philosophical questions always uh, engaged uh, Nagi Mahfuz. Uh, in his writing are always were depicted and, and posed in his writing. In 66 and 70, from 66 to 71, he returned to national themes. Returned to national. When we say 66 to 71, we know right away that the political uh, situation at that time was uh, was really uh, fragile and uh, and uh, because of the war in in 67 if we may call it war it's not a war uh, if we if we follow the philosophy of uh, uh, the french philosopher uh, baudrillard uh, actually when he said about the gulf air he wrote three articles the gulf war the gulf war will not happen the gulf war is not happening the gulf war did not happen and what he said that we did not see two arms meeting each other fighting each other uh, we only saw some bombardments going on on the tv s screen and so the war in 67 we have to put the word war in brackets actually or in quotation marks because because it was not a real war there were no two armies meeting each other it, the, the loss here happened because of treason because of uh, uh, stupidity of the of the of the uh, the, the military uh, head uh, the, the head of the military egyptian military and the president himself anyhow so th th uh, during that time from 66 to 71 he published the first his first novel adrift on the nile tharthara fawqan nil and this novel depicts the egyptian society in the mid 60s and uh, and how uh, opportunism and disillusionment uh, prevailed in the society and what that was like nagib mahfouz's prophecy of the coming loss even before it happened and it, the, the loss happened a few months later um, unfortunately then another novel in 67 
he published his Miramar. Miramar is a name of a guest house in Alexandria that still existed until now. And it's owned by an elderly Greek lady called Mariana. And the guest house is inhabited, inhabited by different uh, people who represent the Egyptian society. They came from different walks of life. And uh, the novel is divided into five parts and each part is narrated by a different uh, character narrating the same events but from their perspective from his or her perspective um, in 71 he published the mirrors the mir al maraya and it divided alphabetically into chapters and each chapter deals with a certain character in nagi mahfuz life and the novel again covers the social and political development uh, of Egypt in the first half of the 20th century. But uh, unlike Cairo trilogy, Mahfouz is, uh, adopts a modernist style uh, in writing it. Uh, in 77, he returned to universal uh, themes and uh, again depicting uh, pre-modern Egypt, not modern Egypt, but the, the narrative is modernist narrative uh, and in his novel Al-Harafish, published in 77, and it's a collection of uh, tales set in old Cairo uh, in which Mahfouz, I quote Edward Said saying, uh, Mahfouz translated the absolute into history character, event, temporal, sequence, and place. And it, uh, we can see that in each uh, tale, there is always this uh, conflict between good and, uh, and evil, and the triumph of good in the end, and the triumph of law, and the triumph of uh, modernity over the, 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 the pre-modern way of, in, uh, of living in Egypt. Uh, like uh, like depending on power instead of respecting uh, the law, for example. In 85, he published his Al-Aish fil haqiqa Akhnaton Dwella in Truth, in 85. And the, the theme of the novel, again, is universal theme, even though the the novel is set in ancient Egypt. So here he returns to write about ancient uh, Egypt and uh, the writing mode, the narrative is modernist uh, narrative. And uh, uh, Akhenaton here, even though this he is the main character, of course we know Akhenaton is the, the Egyptian king or prophet who called his people to, uh, to worship uh, the sun the, the, the sun was a representation of God, the only one God. And instead, instead of the old gods they worshipped, so turned them from worship, worshipping Amun to worship Aton. So he, he was, that's why he was called Akhenaton. And uh, the story starts with somebody t trying to uh, ask people about Akhenaton, asking so many people about Akhenaton, and everyone gave him a, a different description of Akhenaton. Um, telling him a diff different opinion about Akhenaton. Uh, and Akhenaton himself did not appear in the novel. So Akhenaton here is like the truth. We all have different versions uh, and different opinions about the truth. Uh, and who knows who uh, is right and who is wrong. So uh, it, it reminds me of personally, it's of uh, Rumi's tale that uh, about the four blind people touching different parts of the elephant and each one of them gave a different description of the elephant. Uh, so let me conclude here uh, my talk about Nagi Mahfouz and how his writing moved from national themes to universal themes and how his literature moved from uh, national literature to become world literature. In terms of setting and themes, he started uh, uh, by writing novels set in ancient Egypt, uh, depicting the history of ancient Egypt for example, Thebes struggle. And then he moved to write about and describe modern Egypt, the history of modern Egypt, for example, Cairo trilogy and Miramar and so on. Uh, in terms of writing mode, he started with the historical realist narrative, then to socialist, the social realist narrative, then the modernist narrative, as I explained throughout the, the lecture. Uh, about the universal themes, he started with uh, novels 
set in ancient Egypt, as I said, like uh, in 85, when he later on moved from being or from writing on national themes to writing on universal themes. When he wrote about ancient Egypt in 85, he didn't write about it as uh, in historical uh, realist narrative, no, he wrote about it in modernist narrative. And uh, like, for example, the Dwella in Truth, Al Aish fil Haqiqa. He's talking about the relative truth, the relativity of truth. And then he also wrote about modern Egypt, like the search, at Tariq, a person in search of his father without finding him a person in search of the truth without find, finding the truth so uh, it's a, again it's set in modern Egypt but the mode of writing is modernist uh, narrative this is how when we uh, go through the writings of Nagib Mahfouz we see how he moved in terms of uh, themes in terms of uh, setting and writing mode how he moved from uh, being national into universal and how he moved from his literature moved from national literature to be considered world uh, literature uh, this is the end of part two Part three, we'll talk about Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet. I'll give you a break now and I will see you soon in part three.